Before we left off, we've been talking about the lysogenic cycle, and so let's just kind of do a quick, I guess, overview of that. Um, so we have, let's just say, our bacteria here, and then there's this bacterial chromosome containing a prophage. Um, so this is really, really rare to most viruses. It's usually only within about 10% of the phage viruses that we know of. Uh, and then this prophage is being constantly being repressed. It's not transcriptionally active, because remember, bacteria have 100% exonic DNA. And then so through some type of an environmental stress, uh, let's, so let's just say, you know, UV rays, switch to the right color. UV rays come in here, and it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be UV rays, anything that would cause damage to the bacterial chromosome, I guess is the point that I'm trying to make. Activating certain types of repair enzymes that are going to cleave the repressor protein, thus making the prophage transcriptionally active again. If the prophage becomes transcriptionally active again, we have uh, not only the host chromosomes being degraded, but we have phage viruses building up inside here, which can ultimately burst and end in lysis. So that would complete the lysogenic cycle. It could be lytic, it could not be lytic. It just depends on the circumstances. The lytic and lysogenic, or just really the viral prophage in general, is that this can cause certain bacteria to become pathogenic that normally weren't. So take, for example, uh, E. coli. This is a gram-negative bacterium that lives inside of my intestine and inside of your intestine, and it's not going to really hurt you. Um, but it's also known notoriously for causing food poisoning. And this is what happens whenever that viral prophage gets integrated in there. Uh, it becomes pathogenic and starts, you know, acting and having a very different behavioral as opposed to when it normally be. This is not transduction. Transduction is involving a phage virus that contains a piece of bacterial DNA uh, in the classic sense. Another thing that you should also know about viral prophages is that they're constantly methylating and then demethylating their uh, DNA in order to avoid being eaten up by bacterial restriction enzymes. So as you know, bacteria have been at war with viruses for billions of years. They have means of protecting themselves. They have enzymes that if they spot a piece of viral DNA, they're going to go in and they're going to eat them up. They're going to degrade it down into something it can use. And, but it also depends on whether or not it's methylated or unmethylated, depending on the circumstances. I've been going back and forth for a couple billion years. There's also temperate phages. These are ones that can be lytic or lysogenic, uh, just varying depending on which we're talking about here. And the example of this would be lambda phage, which we use uh, is a very good uh, in genetic engineering vector of delivering those genes of interest to the bacteria. Okay, so now let's kind of switch gears and talk about animal viruses. And what they are is they're envelopes. So let's just say that we have an envelope here, and this is a, a plasma membrane inside of it, and inside of it is a viral capsid, something that all bacteria or all viruses have. It's genome, and then uh, some glycoproteins here, and that's what you would have for an animal virus. The glycoprotein structures that I'm drawing out here, this dictates the host range. So for say, like say influenza, it could be pigs, it could also be humans, it could be um, very, very broad or very, very specific. So it could be, say, uh, certain types of cells, specific cells, uh, specific cells in a system, and the, the variation between that is very large. It can affect, it cannot infect plants, fungi, or bacteria. What do all these things have in common, aside from the fact that they're not animals, which kind of lends itself, but they have a cell wall. Cell wall. There's not anything that it can get through in that because it has that piece of that membrane that it takes with it. Okay, cool. So one of the things that animal viruses can have is oncogenes. Yeah. So certain animal viruses can contain oncogenes, and these are just genes that code, it's a fancy way of saying oncology. If you're an oncologist, you study cancer, or you're a doctor that specializes in treating cancer. So certain viruses can contain genes that can make their host cells become cancerous, or they can also disturb the proto-oncogenes inside of host cells. And these are genes that help keep that balance between proliferating too much or, you know, not being effective at doing its job. The most, I guess, the, the best observable, noticeable thing that we can see this is in the RSV in chicken, the Roos sarcoma virus. Uh, and so I'm in chicken, I get infected with this, and then two weeks later I'm covered in tumors and I am dead. Um, other, I guess, human viruses that are hypothesized to do this would be HPV, adenovirus, and HIV. Um, however, I, the I don't agree with a whole lot of this uh, conventional thinking. I think that there's more studies need to be done. We need to really know for sure before we start saying things. Uh, take, for example, HPV. Uh, if there's an even number of men who have e HPV and an even number of women who have HPV, it takes two people to do the deed, uh, then why are cervical cancer rates so high and penile cancer rates so low if there's an even number of people infected with HPV? 
just a hypothesis there. Uh, this kind of relates back to when we were talking about Cook's postulates and how microbes play a role in disease. So it's a bit more complex than that. All right. So let's move on to the Baltimore classification of viruses. And a guy by the name of David Baltimore, who you guys know that I just love so much, came up with this classification. So over here we have double-stranded DNA as a, a viral genome structure here. And this is really good because it's, it's faithfully replicated well and it's a lot more stable than what you'd expect with, uh, expect with a RNA genome. I guess some examples of this would be HPV, the adenovirus, I'm just going to say AD for that, adenovirus, uh, herpes, herpes, and then polio. Yeah, so double-stranded DNA. And there are some that contain a single-stranded piece of DNA, which is kind of hard, confusing when you think about it. And the only type that uh, our book lists is something called a parovirus. Be sure that I'm spelling that right. <clears throat> and otherwise known as B19, and this causes a skin irritation, a skin rash, or anything like that, but it's really unusual to see uh, single-stranded DNA. And there's also viruses that contain double-stranded RNA, um, so I guess we are to switch colors here to green. It's RNA and it's double-stranded. Um, this is one of those, I guess, weak points, though, in terms of a viral genome, because we, uh, eukaryotes, will never, ever, ever use this. So this is something that we can use uh, specifically. We have evolved mechanisms that can target this. I guess what would an example be of something that uses a, a double-stranded RNA would be like a Colorado tick fever or a rotavirus. Those would be examples of that. Okay, cool. So moving on, uh, let's just talk about real briefly about positive and negative sense, which is what these two signs here that I've denoted as. So when you're talking about single-stranded RNA, you're talking about two types. There's single-stranded RNA that's positive, means that it directly can be used as messenger RNA. It gets inside the cell and it can be used immediately as messenger RNA. However, there's also the negative sense of single-stranded RNA, and these are not able to be used as messenger RNA. So we have to go from negative sense, and we have to encode it back into, convert it to a positive sense. Uh, which kind of does take a little bit of time, but not too bad. Okay, so what would be some examples of a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus? Um, well, <laughs> I guess there's lots of different ones that we could use, but I'm just going to use uh, the most, I guess, notorious ones, which would be hepatitis C. Hepatitis C would be an example of that. Um, let's see what else our book says. Um, the virus that it causes SARS, which was a pretty massive outbreak of that in the recent years of China, um, and lots of other, you know, ones, uh, West Nile. I'm just listing these for the sake of fun facts. You don't, I don't think it's vitally important that one knows these. And then there are also single-stranded RNA, but they're negative sense. So again, it's not going to be able to directly code for messenger RNA. It's going to have to convert its viral genome into messenger RNA uh, in order to, for the virus to replicate itself. And I guess the most disturbing, <laughs> I guess creepy example of this would be Ebola, which causes uh, hemorrhagic fever, which may seem counterintuitive considering the severity of it for it being negative since you figured uh, it's so acute in onset. But the delay time between these two, th there's no correlation between that. Another example of a single-stranded RNA virus uh, are ones that use reverse transcriptase, and this includes, for example, RSV, the retrovirus, and the most notoriously one known as HIV. So it's a single-stranded RNA here, and then through an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, because we're doing the exact opposite of what transcription is, which is going from DNA to messenger RNA, we're going from RNA to DNA. So right here we have RNA and then reverse transcriptase comes in and does his thing and then clears that up and what you get as a final product is double-stranded I'm trying to draw this right here double-stranded DNA sometimes called C DNA because it is complementary DNA I guess something that doesn't quite make sense to me though is that this enzyme here reverse transcriptase is what's been known to give HIV a lot of its uh, 
the mutations rate of it. It's not the best at doing its job. But we don't really see that when we're using reverse transcriptase PCR. We don't see that when we're looking at retrotransposons. They're very good at doing that. I guess HIV just inherited a different form of reverse transcriptase that is prone to a lot of mutations. Cool. Viroids, and depending on how well you know you Greek, you know that anything that ends in an oid means that it is similar. So these are similar to viruses. And they don't have any capsule protein coating them, or capsomeres, whichever you like to call it. But they do contain long, double-stranded RNA that's on anywhere between the range of 100 to 400 nucleotides long. Um, <clears throat> what's really interesting about this is, remember, RNA, like where we get like lots of ribozymes and things like that, it can self-fold in on itself, giving rise to this three-dimensional structure here. And this three-dimensional three structure gives it a resistance to ribonucleases. And this is only really found in infectious in plants. But I just want to really, I guess, stress the implementations of this. So when we had talked about single-stranded RNA viruses, um, so like, say, HIV, and once that viral genome is in, you know, set loose inside of the cell, something interesting happens. It stays like that. I, I, what I don't understand is if... If this can happen in this long double-stranded, which would be much more stable, single-stranded RNA is very unstable. So it, I don't understand why it doesn't, you know, coil up and form a, like a hairpin model or anything like that. But nobody's really answered me with that. So, anyways, that's viroids, and they're kind of getting off topic here. That's viroids, and that's what they do.